welcome back. And so then let's move to the next speaker, uh, Dr. James Fang. He is an assistant, assistant professor in Department of Applied Biology and Chemical Technology, uh, the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. His main research area includes marine biology, environmental toxicology, cellular biology, ecophysiology, and analytic chemistry. Okay, also, as you, again, a very wide uh, range of uh, spanning from chemistry to uh, biology to toxicology. So today he will provide a training on the under the topic of microplastics pollution. Yeah, please, uh, Dr. Fang. Yeah. yeah, good morning. Can can you see my square screen, please? Yes, it's very clear. Okay. I may have some technical issue here, but it should be fine if you can see my screen. Let's start, let's start, let's start. Yeah. Good morning, this is James from Hong Kong. Since this is a technical workshop, today I will focus on methodology when we talk about microplastic pollution. I believe all of you should have some basic background in microplastic that Therefore, I would like to skip the introduction. We directly jump to the methodology, how we develop a method to analyze microplastic in bio biological sample. Here we use, we will use the Raman, spectro, Raman spectrometry to identify microplastic in seafood and other biological samples. This slide show you the common procedure of what we determine microplastic in biological or environmental samples. Each procedure come with its own technical concern. Here they are. In this study, we try to adjust this technical concern one by one. Objective one is to identify a, identify a suitable substrate. As you know, microplastic are solid particles. We have to use some filter membrane or sieve to isolate these particles from liquid media in order to facilitate the next step. We use different types of filter paper. However, the material of this filter paper will cause some interference to some specific spectroscopic approaches, for example, Raman spectrometry. Therefore, we like to compare the performance of different filter paper and to identify the most suitable one. When we have to extract microplastic from biological sample, we want to digest the biomass, organic or inorganic biomass as much as possible some of this digestion method may not be complete. They may not be complete. Therefore, therefore, in some cases, we lead the next step, density separation. The undigest biological materials together with microplastic will be placed in a high density solution in order to float the lighter microplastic to the surface for user collection. This is the density separation step. Incomplete digestion, incomplete digestion will cause some problem. For example, in Raman spectrometry, as you know, biological materials, a lot of them have octofluorescent. This octofluorescent is the major interference to Raman signal in the analysis. About density separation, it works for most type of microplastic. However, based on density separation, it is less effective for some higher density microplastic. Therefore, we may lose part of the microplastic of concern. In this study, objective two, we try to increase the biomass digestion efficiency of our digestion process in order to bypass the lead of density separation. This is objective two. When we have isolated microplastic, we will use Raman spectrometry to analyze, to identify what they are, what they are. 
However, the chemicals used in this treatment, the treatment I mean is the biomass digestion treatment and the density separation treatment, they may cause some damage. They may cause some damage or a sample loss to the particle themselves, to the particle themselves. Therefore, we would like to determine the particle recovery rate of microplastic under the digestion method that we developed in objective two. This is objective three, the particle recovery rate. The next objective is to assess any change in morphology or surface damage of this particle due to the use of different chemicals in our method, okay? Objective four. Objective one, two, three, four will allow us to develop a method to develop an improved method compared to the common approaches. Then we come to objective five. We try to identify microplastic using a more advanced approach, automate mapping approach. Why do we do this? Because the conventional approach to identify particle one by one is time consuming and prompt to handling errors. Therefore, we use the Raman technology to develop our automate approach to increase the efficiency. Okay, this is the overview of this lecture today. How do we develop a method that can improve the current approaches in microplastic analysis? Objective one. The first objective is to identify a suitable filter membrane to isolate microplastic from liquid media. Here, we compare three types of common filter paper made of glass fiber, cellulose ester, and stainless steel. In this graph, I show you the Raman signal of each materials. Look at the glass fiber. It has a strong fluorescent peak that is not appropriate, which cover most of the signal of the plastic polymer, which is not good. Cellulose ester contain a lot of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And this composition indicates in this peak in its Raman spectrum, which is not ideal too, because a lot of this peak overlap with the peak of plastic polymer. Now we look at the stainless steel membrane. It has low signal level with flag based light, which seems to be good, which seems to be good. From this, from this data, we think, we think stainless steel may be good. So the next step, we do an evaluation. We put polystyrene, PS, a common type of microplastic with different particle size, 10 micron, 100 micron, 300 micron on each type of this field of paper, glass fiber, cellulose, and stainless steel. We found that for the larger particle size, larger than 100 micron, the effect of field of paper seems to be okay. All type of field of paper are doing, are doing well in this particle identification under Raman spectrometry. However, when the particle size reduced to around 10 micron, the glass fiber and cellular ester, they just don't work, they just don't work. If we look at the peak of the polystyrene on these two type of materials, very clearly the characteristic of polystyrene disappear when the particle size decreases to 10 micron. The shape just total difference with what we expect from polystyrene. Look, look at this spectrum and that spectrum. However, stainless steel, even the machine index, the efficiency to identify the material decreased to around 0.5, the peak and the characteristic of this Raman spectrum can still be distinguished, can still be identified. Therefore, from this data, 
we conclude stainless steel membrane is among the most appropriate compared to the other two materials in Raman spectrometry to identify microplastic. Good, now we have identified our suitable materials for membrane filter. The next objective is to increase the biomass digestion efficiency. When we have the biological sample, we want to digest the biomass to extract the microplastic. Here we use two types of biomass as demonstration, muscles and fish, muscle and fish. We have three types of treatment, K, KH and KHE. K represents the treatment of potassium hydroxide. KH is the treatment of potassium hydroxide added with hydrogen peroxide to boost the digestion efficiency. KHE, the condition is very similar to the condition of KH, but we add EDTA, a common declassifying agent used in histology. Okay, we use EDTA here to digest the calcium rich tissue type. For example, the mantle in muscles and some bone fragment in fish. In total, there are six treatments muscle free treatment, fish free treatment here in total six. Here, result, the result. We look at the muscle biomass. All three type of treatments, they did well to digest the biomass of muscle. The digestion efficiency higher than 99.9% in terms of weight, in terms of dry weight, in terms of dry weight. When we look at the fish biomass, the digestion efficiency is much improved when we have added EDTA in the KHE treatment, okay? Increased by more than 20%. Now we look at the photo of the filter membrane, showing you the amount of bi biological residual after each digestion treatment. For muscle, for muscle. In the treatment K and treatment KH, the conventional digestion method, there was still a lot of biomass remain on the filter membrane. They are very lightweight, they're very lightweight, and therefore they cannot be really represent by this data using dry weight, in dry weight, because they're very light, they're very light. They're light, but they cover a large area on this filter membrane. As we have discussed on the last slide, these biological materials, they have a strong octofluorescent that will, that can interfere the Raman signal, which is not good, which is not good. And therefore, for muscle, we recommend KHE, the treatment KHE. You see the digestion is very clear. For fish, the result is even clearer. The biological residual here, mostly bone fragments. The, the, the efficiency is impressive for fish. Good, good, good. From this result, we have identified the treatment KHE is more suitable for the digestion process for fish and muscle in comparison to the conventional digestion method. What's next? The next objective is to determine the particle recovery rate using the KHE treatment. What do we do here? We have free treatment of KHE, chemicals only, and the treatments, the KHE solution with the muscle biomass and with the fish biomass, free treatment, free treatment. We use seven type of microplastic in this evaluation. We mix all this plastic together and split into the free treatment, which were subject to the same digestion procedure. After the digestion, we retrieve 
this plastic particle on stainless steel filter membrane and to identify and locate this particle on this filter membrane using Raman spectrometry. The results are shown in panel B and C and color code. We can identify different type of microplastic, where are they in where they are on the filter membrane. Good, impressive finding. The recovery rate, here are the data, here are the data. The results are impressive. The recovery rate, we can achieve 90 to 100%, which is good, which is good. Now we know our method can have a high recovery rate of microplastic. The next question is, the next question is, if the use of this chemical will cause any damage on a particle, because Raman spectrometry or FTIL, the infrared approach, mostly concern on the surface characteristic, the surface composition of different chemicals, different compounds, I mean, if there's any damage or change on the surface, the result may be affected too. Therefore, we'd like to see any change in size, any surface damage, or any change in morphology on the surface of microplastic. Here are the results. On this slide, we compare we compare the surface of microplastic not treated with KHE and treated with KHE. They are different particles, they are different particles. Some particles treat with KHE, some particles don't. We didn't observe a clear, we didn't observe a clear change due to the KHE treatment based on scanning electron microscope. This is the SEM images. We don't observe any clear change. Then we use another approach. We use 3D scanning technology, 3D laser scanning technology. We scan the surface of particle to see the change in surface area. Again, the surface area remain very similar before and after the treatment KHE. Some slight change were detect on polypropylene and PVC, they are test by dependent T-test. Therefore, they, even the error bar is large, you still see the difference. But still, even we detect this minor change, does this affect the accuracy of our approach? Does this affect the accuracy of Raman identification? This is the important question. We know any chemical, we induce a certain extent of damage on the surface of particle, but does it matter? Does it matter? This is the question we want to find out. To answer this question, we compare the Raman spectrum before and after, before and after, for seven type of microplastic, as same as those used for the recovery test, Deposit putting is not relevant here. You can allow this graph. Seven type of microplastic, yes. The red color represent the Raman spectrum before KHE. The blue color represent the Raman spectrum after the treatment KHE. They look very similar. But how similar? We try to correlate the, the spectra before and after, and we find that they are highly similar, they are highly similar. 94 to 99% similarity, okay? This funding tell us, okay, the method is good. Even we use some chemical and this chemical induce minor effect on the surface, the identification can still be efficient up to 99%. Good. From the founding from objective one to objective four, 
we have developed a method to identify, to extract and identify mycoplasma from biological sample. In this case, seafood sample. The last objective here is to develop an automated mapping approach for mycoplastic to improve the conventional approach, which is more time consuming and prone to handling errors. On this slide, I show you two particles, polypropylene and polyethylene. Here I show you the Raman spectra of them. The red color spectrum is the sample, sample spectrum. How do we do the identification? When we get the red color spectrum, sample spectrum, we match this spectrum to the database that we have to match this spectrum with a lot of plastic standard spectra to identify, to identify what it is. For these two particles, they were identified as polypropylene and polyethylene. You see the you see the peak position, they merge, they are uh, matched perfectly. Okay, high identification. This is a single particle approach, single particle approach. We want to improve this single particle approach to a higher throughput. How to do multiple identification at the same time, over the same period of time. This is an example. Let's say we want to identify the particle in this two dimensional area. We get the Raman spectrum at each single cross point on this grid. If the particle fall on this cross point, they can be identified. In this example, the four red color particle can be identified. However, if the particle is too small, if the particle is smaller than the interval between two cross bond, they cannot be identified because they are too small. Therefore, the interval between the two cross points also defines the resolution of your spectral scopic approach, which defines how small the particles we can detect in our method. Using this concept, we have developed a method to identify particles on stainless steel membrane. This is one of the results. This is one of the results. In panel A, I show you the stainless steel membrane. On this membrane, you see some patches of biological residual, also mycoplastic. Panel B, show you the automated mapping approach using Raman spectrometry. In this case, we can identify three types of plastic polymer, polypropylene, polyethylene, and PET fiber, the PET fiber here, which is common in marine environments. Panel C is the superimposed image of A and B. From panel C, we can locate where these microplastics are on this fetal membrane. This approach is good and reliable and save much of our time because it is automated. Using the method developed on the last few slides, this is the result from muscle and fish collect from Hong Kong. When we do the analysis of microplastic, we usually report the number, the quantity of microplastic in this individual or per unit weight, per unit dry weight or per unit wet weight. In this case, per individual. We have the size distribution curve for fish, for muscle and for fish. We also report the shape of this microplastic. In this case, we only find fragment and fiber. The most important data is here, the polymer type, the polymer type. In this case, we identified that polypropylene is the dominant type, okay? 
when we report microplastic, we usually report these three parameters, the quantity, the shape, and the polymer type. This slide summarizes what we have discussed on the last few slides. When we have the bio biological sample, we use the treatment KHE to digest the biomass, then to extract the microplastic retained on stainless steel filament membrane, the particles including microplastic on this stainless steel membrane are identified by an automated mapping approach of warmer spectrometry. This is the flow of the analysis of microplastic in our lab. Now we have the method. The next question is, we know microplastic exists in seafood, for example, muscle. We would like to know then how many pieces of microplastic can be ingested by us can be ingested by us, the human. We have done this study in the eastern water of Hong Kong at five important mariculture zones in Hong Kong. We collect muscle, analyze the microplastic, and do estimate the human ingestion rate through consumption of this biograph shellfish. Here are the result using the method I've shown you on the last few slides. From north to south, we quantified the number of microplastic in this muscle. We have identified the high risk area among different locations. In this case, in Tolo Harbor, the Yin Bay area with slow flow. On this slide, this is the mapping approach that we have just learned. From this study, we have done a more careful size di distribution curve to show you the particle size around 100 micron is the most abundant in the Hong Kong waters. On this slide, I show you the Raman spectrum of polypropylene isolated from the muscle sample collected from Hong Kong water. Three pieces here. Polypropylene represent the most abundant polymer type in muscles in Hong Kong. As we have discussed, he, when we report the data, we report the polymer type, we report the shape, and we report the, the shape in terms of each polymer type, okay? Something interesting we found here, a lot of this microplastic in fragment form. However, PET, they mostly occur in fiber. They mostly occur in fiber. Now we come to the most important question. How many pieces of microplastic can be ingested by us through muscle consumption? In order to estimate the human consumption rate, we lead the data from another source. We lead the consumption rate of bio shellfish before we can calculate the injection rate of microplastic through muscle consumption, okay? The consumption rate of bio shellfish and other seafood, the data provided by, food, by the Food and Environmental Hygiene Department based on Hong Kong population. We have this piece of information. Here is the data. The whole population average is around 800 gram per person per year. Within this whole population, 15 of them are regular consumer of seafood. They have a higher consumption rate of bio shellfish, around 5,600 gram per person per year. With this data, and with the data of microplastic we collect from our study, with this and that, we can calculate the human ingestion rate of microplastic through consumption of muscle. Here, are the data, simple calculation, multiplied by this and that. 
now we have the number of human injection rate. Does this number, is this number high or low compared to other places? Then we have done a comparison worldwide. I have highlighted the data in this study from Hong Kong. This column, the third column, show you the human consumption rate of biowaf. The next column show you the human injection rate of microplastic calculate from the consumption rate of biowaf. Okay. When we compare this column, it seems that the human injection rate of microplastic is quite high, is quite high, similar to this value obtained from Europe and our values are higher than all other previous study. Okay. Conclusion here is the human injection rate of microplastic is high in Hong Kong and probably some other region in Southeast Asia too, because we have similar eating habit and diet. The data can also be expressed, expressed per meal. How many pieces of microplastic can be consumed in a single meal? if we consume fiber shellfish. Again, I highlight our data here, up to 458. This number is higher than some other study, but much lower than this study in Italy, okay? In conclusion here, the ingestion rate of microplastics in Hong Kong and some other places of worldwide are high, are high. Now we know we ingest a lot of microplastic every year. But so what? So what? What does it mean? Are they harmful? Do they cause any harmful effect on us? This question is important, but remain unclear. Remain unclear. We need more research, including research in my lab. We are trying to estimate the human health risk of microplastic. But at least we know we are eating a lot of microplastic every year. Apart from muscle, now we move to oyster. Why we move to oyster? Because oyster represent a more popular seafood worldwide, worldwide. How do we eat oyster? A lot of us eat oyster raw without cooking, which induces even higher risk of contamination. What we have been doing, we have been collecting oyster in the East Asia region, including China, Korea, and Japan. We have been doing this since 2019, and we collect oyster sample every year, try to find the temporal pattern, or spatial temporal pattern of microplastic in the East Asian region. Our next step is to extend our study to the Southeast Asia region. We have contact collaborator in different country, they have agreed to sample oyster for us. However, under the situation of COVID-19, our sampling has been po postponed to next year. It was supposed to start in this year, but unfortunately, because of a lockdown, we just couldn't get the oyster. So we start from next year. If you are interested in this collaboration, you please feel free to talk to us. We are happy to collaborate. This is part of the project of Professor Kenneth Leung, the worldwide history project. It's part of his project. That's the end of my presentation today. In this, if you want to know more information about what we have discussed, please read these two papers from my lab. Okay. This study is supported by the Stakey Laboratory of Marine Pollution at the City University of Hong Kong. Thank you. Now we come to Q&A. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Uh, James. So very interested and uh, very interesting plastic story. Uh, also think about the risk, okay. <laughs> right, so to save time, maybe we can only accommodate one question from the audience.
Any any question from from the audience? Please either you type in the in the chat room or just speak it out. All right. Or otherwise, we will move on to the next speaker. Okay, Professor Rudolf Fu. So Professor Rudolf Fu yep. is, is a professor and advisor in environmental science from the Department of Science and Environmental Studies, the Education University of Hong Kong. His main research area includes environmental science and management, and marine ecology, marine mm -hmm. pollution, and ecotoxicology. Eco Today, he will provide a training under the topic of uh, environmental mm -hmm. monitoring. Yeah, mm -hmm. Professor Wu. Uh, yeah. yeah, good morning, everybody. And James, could you- uh, hey, so how, 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 how can I share? Ah, stop yeah. share. Okay, okay. I found it. Okay, yeah. thank you. Oh, I know. Mm. Yeah, can you see the slide? Can you see the slides, really. guys? Not really. Uh, James, 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 please uh, quit rather than stop sharing. Chris, oh, okay, let's see. Can you see the slide uh, now? Uh, it's clear okay now. Thank okay. you. Um, so please go ahead. Okay, good. Thank you, everybody. And today I'd like to talk about environmental monitoring. As everybody working in the environmental field will know that the vast majority of work and research are de dedicated to environmental monitoring and environmental control in order to let us have a good and healthy environment. <laughs> No, and in this talk, I'll talk about environmental monitoring, why bother? Why bother spending so much money in doing environmental monitoring? And there's two major types of environmental monitoring. The first type is physical monitoring and chemical monitoring, which is relatively easy. And the second part is still in the developmental stage, which we call biological monitoring, and which can overcome a lot of shortcomings and uh, <clears throat> Cannot, which cannot be done by the physical and chemical monitoring. And in biological monitoring, we have two major types of uh, monitoring too. The first is bioindicator, and the second is biomarkers. And I'll talk about these two um, in great detail in the coming 60 minutes. Now, the first is that environmental monitoring, why bother? And you see that for every, in every country, every regulatory more, more, uh, authority, they try to monitor environmental parameter in a regular basis for long term. <clears throat> now, the reason is that why bother is that they, we want to detect these temporal changes of environmental factors of uh, due to this pollution. And to ask the question is that our environmental condition getting better or getting worse? Right? So it's getting better, so we're happy, getting worse, we've got to do something about it. And the second objective is trying to detect the spatial changes of these environmental factors or pollution. So this would help us to identify where's the hotspots, who discharge where, who discharge the pollution, and uh, it, to what extent, and who, and where is the most important uh, or most polluted uh, area. And then we try to identify the pollution, so pollution sources, and then also the area effect, how big an area is being affected. So this will help the environmental managers to make this uh, inform, informed decision. 
The third objective is trying to check the compliance with the established environmental guidelines, air quality objective or water quality objective. Say in most, if not all government, we have established a range of environmental guidelines saying that, oh, we, in this area, we should like to keep the environmental variable uh, below this range. And then the air quality PM 2.5 should not exceed certain limit. Water quality objective, something like the nutrient uh, standard should not exceed this limit. Dioxin should not exceed this limit. And then uh, metals should not exceed this limit and so on and so forth. And this is why we have to regularly monitor to see whether we are doing a good job or doing a satisfactory job to keep what we promise to the general public in order to protect our environment. And notably, and one question that we asked during Kenny's talk is that for this environmental guideline, air quality objective, water quality objective, they are very different between countries. And there's a one country may use a loose system, the other country use a stringent system. It all depends on the number of factors, whether you can afford to do that and whether uh, it's doable. Now, finally, the objective of doing environmental monitoring is to determine whether the environmental level of contaminant is acceptable to the general public and environmental health. Now, just like if we find uh, the mercury level <clears throat> in the environment is higher than what we said, so we have to check that the government need to do something. Either you tell people don't get the fish or alternatively, <clears throat> you said, okay, let's control the source, control the amount of pollution going into the water and then to protect the general public health. To start with, a lot of environmental monitoring days all over the world, they spend lots of money in doing the environmental monitoring. And after a while, they say, oh, we can't afford it. Or we do it for something like half a year, one year, and we stop. I'll tell you for nothing. If you either you decide to have environmental monitoring or you don't, and then, if you decided to do environmental monitoring, you have to do it on a fairly long term to uh, provide the data so that they can answer your question, just like these two whole couples. They must have a major commitment saying that, <clears throat> okay, we are going to do this in the long run. Otherwise, just imagine, if you want to sort of detect the level of environmental changes, and then so half a year, one year may not give you the reliable data. And you spend lots of money, lots of time in investing into the startup and end up with nothing. Now, first we talk about the physical and chemical monitoring. <clears throat> it's become relatively easy nowadays. And then everybody can spend something like uh, 600 or 500 US dollar to buy a sort of a <clears throat> meter which enable you to measure salinity, temperature, dissolve oxygen, all in one go. All you need to do is to dip this in the water <clears throat> and then they give you the reading, relatively easy. And then of course, for air pollution, and then you have this <clears throat> station collecting the matters from particularly in, from the air. <clears throat> now and then we analyze data and so on. And in open ocean, or some, something like uh, in the coastal water, and then you may like to, sometimes you may like to collect seawater or collect fresh water using <clears throat> the water sampler. And afterwards, you concentrate this, and then you do the chemical analysis in your laboratory. But with the advancement of this instrument, and now we are able to do ocean buoy, so effective ocean buoy is a buoy, and then you then install the sort of sensor, something like nutrient sensor, dissolved oxygen sensor, or salinity sensor, temperature sensor, or even measure coral field using all these devices. <laughs> then you don't have to go and collect the data. These, the signal received by this sensor can be related to satellite, and then the satellite can be, so to relay the message and the data to your laboratory. So all you need to do is to deploy this buoy, and then you sit in the office drinking coffee, and then you record your data in the logger. Relatively easy, right? Simple. Or alternatively, you can put the ocean buoy down there, 
down in the bottom of the sea, even deep sea, and then you transmit the signal through either cable <coughs> or this into the, in the ocean buoy, and then again send the signal back to the laboratory for analysis. So this makes life easier. Now, if you are not satisfied, nowadays the science advancement can enable us just to measure some of the parameters by satellite. All you need to do, because you know the satellite go around the world either once or twice every day. So from the satellite, you can sense the temperature based on the radiations emitted from the sea. After this, uh, receiving this radiation, you can plot the graph and plot it, and then plot the picture to tell you what's the temperature in the water all over the world within a very short time. And then we can also extend this to salinity and based on the relationship between the salinity and the L band microwave frequency emitted. Again, with the satellite, you can collect the data of the L band microwave, and then you can back calculate the salinity just like this figure, just like this figure. And then, so you can again sit in your office and do nothing and collect all this data very quickly. And similarly for chlorophyll, <clears throat> which reflect the total biomass of zooplankton, plankton, and then uh, you have this different spectrum of uh, chlorophyll A, B, and C. And then sometimes you can also measure red tie and use this spectral reflectance signature of color and brightness. Again, within a very short period of time, you can monitor <clears throat> these environmental changes in chlorophyll A and to estimate the phytoplankton biomass within a very short period of time over a very large area. So you all think that's very good. Huh? You give set up the set up the sensor, set the buoy, and use the remote sensing, and you get the data very easily and over large area. You think we should stop here? But in fact, it's not. <laughs> we are if we're measuring chemical and physical data, let's look at what's the problem. Now, the first is that if you have the first year toxicology, you know that the chemicals in the environment may exist in different form. And then different form of the same chemical, they have different bioavailability and different toxicity. That is to say, if you want to measure salinity temperature, and that's relatively easy. Okay, but if you want to measure chemicals like organic chemicals and in organic chemicals like metal, it's not that simple and straightforward. Let's go through this now. So Kenny told you in his talk that uh, mercury is highly toxic, but in fact, <clears throat> mercury in the environment you know, occur in several forms. So again, for elemental mercury, which we use elemental mercury. In the old days, we used elemental mercury in our thermometer. It's relatively harmless. And in fact, you may like to know that in the 18th century, if you got um, <clears throat> these, uh, it's got some problem with your guts and then you cannot def uh, deficit. And then basically <clears throat> you go to the doctor in the UK, they'll give you elemental mercury to drink and a little bit, and then that will help you to go to the toilet. Then even now, of course, we are not doing it nowadays, but nowadays, a lot of people with this amalgam in your teeth, right? If you got to want to repair your teeth and use amalgam, amalgam is a mercury alloy. And you, you have it in your mouth, in your teeth, so you contact it every day, but it's relatively more toxic. Likewise, for you know, organic, mercury, right? It's not readily absorbed and relatively non-toxic. It's toxic, but the toxicity is very low. However, if in the environment, they change it into methyl mercury or dimethyl mercury, that change the picture tremendously because these organic mercury, they are lipid soluble, they're highly toxic. 
they have a very high bioaccumulation potential. Remember the Minamata disease is that because they discharge the inorganic mercury into the water and then the bacteria and fungi turn this into organic matter, okay? Organic mercury that cause Minamata disease is a big disaster. Now, that is to say, if you want to measure mercury in the mine, well, you have to collect the water sample and measure different forms, okay? In fact, if you look at some of the report <clears throat> by various environmental regulatory authority, they just report the total mercury, which means nothing, okay? Now, if you want to measure everything in great detail, even for mercury, for one element, you measure different forms to estimate uh, whether they are bioavailable, whether they are toxic, is a lot of work. Now, the other example is something like this organic pollutant, like we call the persistent organic chemicals, like POPs. The most obvious case is the dioxin, dibenzofurin. These chemicals, they occur in very large area over the world. However, when you want to collect water sample to measure them, they're in very low concentration as past per trillion and some, some pollutant in past per quadrillion. Well, under normal circumstances, you have to do a lot of work to concentrate this and then before you can actually do this chemical analysis. And it's not an easy job. And because even you measure this, you contaminate uh, using very clean apparatus to collect the water sample, make sure they don't stick to your water bottle. And then a lot of work to turn these chemicals into measurable form. Now, even you've done that, the chemical determination often very difficult, very tedious and cost you a lot of money. Just like the case of dioxin or even for metal, you have to extract this from the water. Afterward, you have to purify this, and then you have to concentrate this until it's in measurable concentration. And then before you inject it into GC or LC or ICP, that involves a lot of work, very tedious, lots of money. Now, another typical problem faced by chemical and physical monitoring is that this temporal and spatial variability are extremely high. <laughs> If anybody measured dissolved oxygen before, they know that if you go in the morning, early in the morning, like this curve, okay? <laughs> Sorry, if you go in the, in the evening, and then you'll find that the dissolved oxygen is maybe very low, because at that time, in, during the evening, the photosynthesis would be very low, and respiration rate would be very high. So even the phytoplankton will consume a lot of oxygen and oxygen become low, okay? And particularly they almost use up all the oxygen in the morning. So during dawn, it become hypoxic. The water, this oxygen become very low. And in this, if you go in the midday, with very bright sunlight, when photosynthesis is the peak, you get very high dissolved oxygen. That is to say, for the same site, you have to take sample or measure dissolved oxygen almost every hour. You look at this curve. Your result depends very much on when you go to measure, when you take the measurement. You go in the mid middle of day, it gives you a value of 8.5 milligram per liter. You go and in the dawn, six o'clock in the morning, three parts per million. So which one would you trust? So the only way you can do it to measure this at various time point, but again, this is very tedious. Measure 24 hours over the world, not possible. Now, not only for dissolved oxygen, similarly for chlorophyll. So this is the data from variation from, from Finland. The variation in chlorophyll concentration, the Gulf of Finland. Gulf of Finland is a very small of inlet. You can see from travel from one end to the other, you take the hydro foil, it takes, takes an hour. So you can see that that's the from Tolin to Housing Key, and then it's an hour's boat trip. And then you can see that it depends on where you go, 
the coral field concentration varies. And same as the time, depends on when you go there and then the time varies. And these, again, this data shows you the uh, sink concentration in Victoria Harbor in Hong Kong. Depends on which month you go. And you measure the concentration of metal in the water, it sort of uh, varies tremendously. Now, that's not the, not the end of the problem. The end of the problem is that you find a lot of chemicals in the wine, something like ammonia, metal, trace organic, <clears throat> and even trace organic, you may have pH, PCB, and so on. So in the real world, these different, these different chemicals will interact with each, each other. And then sometimes the effect may be additive, Sometimes the effect may be synergistic. Sometimes the effect, interactive effect can be antagonistic. Now, that is to say, with more than two chemicals, you face the probability that this chemical may reduce the toxicity or enhance the toxicity tremendously. But it's very difficult to determine. Mind you, why we have to determine that? Because if you look at the over 95% of my mental concern is not on the physical presence of the toxicants or the pollution in the water, except something like uh, microplastic <clears throat> or uh, debris, uh, rubbish, and then oil, slick, and so on and so forth. Something like we look at the metal, trace organic, and oxygen, and so on and so forth. We are concerned with the biological effect, not on the sort of physical presence. Now, but however, that's ridiculous because most of the environmental standard guidelines nowadays are predominantly based on physical and chemical parameters. At the moment, we are guessing what will be the effect based on the sort of the value of these physical and chemical parameters, but that may not necessarily be true. Guessing the effect you do a toxicity to estimate what's the effect of pH, dioxin on, the, on fish can, is doable. But however, there's no way that you can look at in the real environment if dioxin interacts with metal, interacts with oxygen, interacts with ammonia. No way that you can do that. And yet you're measuring that, using a lot of effort and money to measure that. Now, again, this is again, first year toxicology, you've got to understand. You find presence of certain chemical in the environment does not mean it's biologically available. Just like what I showed you before for mercury and for a lot of compound, the bioavailability is not equal to present. Find something in the environment, something like, for example, some of the metal in the environment, in the, in the, they may be locked up in the sediment and then not available to the biological system. And then even if they're bioavailable, does not mean they have any effect at all because your body, <coughs> can sort of help to clean up some of these chemicals. And then even the effect does not mean adverse effect. Now, this is why you have a major problem <clears throat> in predicting biological effect <clears throat> and environmental consequence from the chemical data. You collect a lot of chemical and physical data. And based on this data, you try to guess and what will be the biological effect? Are we protecting the environment? Are we having adequate protection of environment? may not necessarily come true. So end up, you may spend a lot of money, a lot of effort, you end up with nothing. Just look at this guy. It's true. This guy spent a lot of time, lots of money in doing chemical and physical risk <clears throat> monitoring. Oh, he found that concentration of benzopyrene is 12 micrograms. And the total pH in fish he measured is 569 microgram per gram. But when you ask the question, so what? Hmm? What does it mean? Is it good, bad? At the most, it, it can refer to the US EPA standard and then the, uh, and something like or Hong Kong standard or China standard, whatever it is. Oh, it exceeds the standard. But is that true? But you, that is to say, based on the concentration, you cannot really predict what will happen in the environment. But if you turn this, this to the other trap, more clever guy, he's 
is the concentration of benzopyrene fish will increase the cancer rate in the fish by 12.8%. 12, 12 and if you eat this fish, that will increase your cancer rate by 2.5%. We have to do something before it is too late, right? So these guys make a lot more sense because they will telling you what will be the consequence, right? In a more accurate way. Now, and people know about this for a long, long time, more than 20 to 30 years. And there's a global trend to supplement biological and ecological criteria in environmental monitoring and setting environmental standard and try to replace the chemical standard. But again, it's not that easy. <clears throat> we look at this biological monitoring, then see what's the advantage in doing biological monitoring in, in place of physical monitoring. Because certain biological responses are very sensitive to environmental changes and level of pollution in the environment. And I'll cite, cite you a lot of examples later on. If you dip the fish into the and so on, so they're very sensitive. And sometimes they may exhibit a quantitative relationship. That is to say that they change in the enzyme level or change in the metal level in their muscles. And these changes is directly related to the environmental concentration. Then as a result, measuring certain biological response may be easier and much more cost effective than doing a whole range of chemical determination. Now, this is a hypothetical example. If you find some biological response, which is in a good relationship between the amino quality, either dissolved oxygen, metal concentration, dioxin, and so on and so forth. If certain enzymes in the body have an established relationship to the amino quality. So instead of measuring the concentration of dioxin or benzopyrene in the water, you measure the enzyme level of the fish in water. Then they will give you a good estimate on the environmental level. At the same time, they'll tell you what will be the biological response. Now, in fact, biological monitoring is not a new thing at all. We've been doing this for more than 50 years. Everybody know about the example of E. coli, fecal coliform bacteria to indicate fecal pollution. We don't go out to collect feces, but rather we collect E. coli and fecal coliform. And then if the concentration of E. coli and fecal coliform is high, that means high level of fecal pollution. For environmental engineers, we all use BOD to measure organic pollution. Instead of measuring the organic compound in the water and measuring different compound and measuring organic pollution directly, we only measure how much oxygen they consume per unit time, per five days, and so on and so forth. So we've been using this for more than 50 years. Now, it's very common for high school and high school kids to go to sort of look at the environment, to see the environment is good. And one typical example is to look at the tree, and then you can go to your sort of uh, your country park or go to your garden to see if you tree. That means the air quality is pretty good, mainly because lichen cannot survive when the air is polluted. And in terms of water, and then if you go to a stream and you find a rainbow trout, that gives you a good indication saying the water is pretty good because rainbow trout, trout cannot afford to sort of <clears throat> uh, survive in water with poor quality. So these are indicators. You find lichen, that means the air quality is good. You find rainbow trout, means the water quality is good. Isn't it much easier? Now, so the advantage of doing biological monitoring instead of chemical monitoring is that this accounts for environmental fate and biological availability. They will tell you the fraction of the pollutant that gone come into the environment, come into the biological system. And then, as I showed you before, 
the temporal variation is tremendous for a lot of chemical parameter. And then, but if the fish or the muscle is sitting over there, they keep on taking up these chemicals. So you measure the concentration of the same chemical in the muscle, in the fish, they will smooth out this temporal variation, provide a time integrated estimate on contaminant level. So instead of going every day <clears throat> to collect water sample, you go every month to collect the muscle sample, the muscle concentration, the concentration of pollutant in muscle <laughs> will give you a very good indication on what's the average or time smoothing, uh, time integrated estimate on the level of dioxin, on the level of metals in the water. That save you a lot of analysis and time and much more cost effective in terms of sampling and analysis. And what's important is that you find the metal concentration or you find the sort of dioxide concentration because it's actually being taken up by fish and by muscle. This can be more easily related to biological effect. So you're looking at the available fraction, which is the most concerned fraction. <clears throat> now, there's two types of, sort of biological monitoring. First is bioindicator, and second is biomarker. <clears throat> bioindicator is a biological indicate a biological response at organismal level or above. That is to say, we're looking at the presence and absence, just like rainbow trout, like lichens. Look at abundance, look at the body burden of pollution. Look at the prevalence of this pathological symptom. If the <clears throat> environmental quality is not good, then probably <clears throat> or most likely you got more pathological symptom in the population. And then if the pollution is high, environmental condition is no good, you expect the so decrease in species diversity, you got less number of species and so on and so forth. This would give you a good indication of environmental changes. <clears throat> now. Some of these bioindicators may be quantitative and some may be quantitative. <clears throat> Biomarkers, what's it? What is it? Biomarker is also looking at biological response, but at suborganismal level, just like molecular response, biochemical response, psychological response, physiological response, indicating a change in the environmental condition. <clears throat> either the presence or absence or the levels of pollutants in the water. Something like, if anybody have any experience going to body check, if you're old enough, you do any body check, you go to the, and if you've got the problem, particularly with hepatitis B or hepatitis A, you go to a medical check and the doctor will take, uh, take a blood sample from you and look at alpha fetoprotein. The alpha fetoprotein is a protein or serum. If it's high, that means you've got liver cancer. And likewise, the, the ALT, AST, and these are also serum biomarkers for liver function. You've got fatty liver, this sort of enzyme would be high. These are typical biomarkers. So you don't actually look at whether you have liver cancer or not, because liver cancer would be very difficult to detect at the early stage. But the alpha fetal protein and the ALT or AST, if it's high, that means it is likely to have liver cancer that you got to go to have a more detailed medical check. So these are the typical medical biomarkers. And these biomarker have now been used to monitor environmental changes nowadays. We all know that the muscles have remarkable ability to take up uh, metals, right? More than thousand, and 10,000 times higher concentration than in the water. Now, when the metals goes into the muscles, they will induce the formation of a protein called methylphyolin. So again, instead of measuring metals, you measure okay. methylphyolin. Sorry? So, so methylphyolin, and then indicate the exposure to metals. And again, a number of these mixed function oxidase, and then like erod, you, if you find high erod concentration in your liver and your fish liver, that means you've been exposed to PAA and PCB in the environment. If you find high level of acetylcholine esterase in the body, that means you've been exposed to organo 
force phase, the pesticide. So again, the measurement is relatively easy and give you very good indication without measuring the these and the pollutants alone. And again, for some genotoxicin, if you make the fish or muscle or mammal has been exposed to this genotoxicin, <laughs> this may cause DNA breakage. So again, DNA breakage or DNA damage would be a very good bioindicator for toxicants. A lot of this antioxidant enzyme like superoxidase, super, superoxide is mutase, the oxidase, if you subject to oxidative stress, and again, this antioxidant enzyme will increase. So you can look at this enzyme level and tell you the history and indirectly uh, the history of the exposure of the animal to the chemicals and also the level of these chemicals in the environment. Now, of course, just like what I said before, you can use BOD, E. coli, <coughs> and sediment also in demand to measure the environmental quality in water, all the burden of metal, trace organic, and we also measure red tide toxin in these mussels and oysters. And then all you need to do is to establish the concentration of these and uh, red tide toxin or trace organic or metals in the water and the relationship in water, which is species specific. Once you establish this, <clears throat> this uh, uh, correlation uh, or regression curve, all you need to do is to take a muscle sample, take an oyster sample from the field, and then you measure the concentration of pollutant is which relatively easy because it's sometimes 10,000 times higher <coughs> than the concentration in water, then you can estimate whether the pollution level is acceptable, high or low in the environment. <coughs> and also but all this uh, indicator can measure this Nice function of individuals, and like the conditioning in condition index, capital somatic index that is how how was the weight of your liver in relation to your body weight, cognitive somatic index, the sort of a size of the gonad in relation to your body, and based on the assumption that because if the animal is not in good shape, you spend less energy in sort of building up your body and building up your gonad. Now your energy reserve and so on and so forth. And then pathological incidents. <laughs> you go to an area, you go to an area, you find the fish, got lots of infection, pathological infection. That means these areas potentially dangerous and with a lot of pollutant that makes the, that reduce the immunity of the fish. <laughs> and then <laughs> one very commonly used example is reproductive for reproductive impairment is impulsive. You know, TBT, fibrotitin, which occur almost <clears throat> all over the world. And then the measuring TBT is very difficult. And also they got different forms. But because TBT can induce what they call the impulse sex in the gastropod, in the snails. So this marine snail, when they subject to TBT, the female will have a penis, have a male sex organ. So relatively easy. All you need to do is to go to the shore, collect these uh, snails, and then crack it down and look at whether they got a penis. To look at the percentage of impulse set, they will give you a very good indication on the level of feed, uh, TBT in the environment. Of course, other like <coughs> growth impairment, developmental disorder, change in species composition, decrease in species diversity and species richness, and so on and so forth. So again, this would give you a good indication on the health of the environment and the pollution level in the environment. For example, for hypoxia means a lack of oxygen in the environment. In a good environment, normoxia, if the environment is supplied with enough oxygen, you got more suspension feeders like this, this uh, uh, <clears throat> bivalve, you got high diversity, high species richness. And then you've got more commercial fish, fish living in the bottom. And then you've got this uh, animal with larger body size. But if the system is hypoxic, that is to say lack of oxygen, all this, all this suspension feeder will be replaced by the deposit feeder, like the polychids and so on and so forth. 
And then the size of the animal would decrease from macrofauna to myofauna. The demersal fish living on the bottom will be replaced by pelagic fish swimming in the water bottle itself. And then the phytoplankton will get smaller in size, become <clears throat> dominated by nanoplankton and microfactory. So all, you don't have to <coughs> measure oxygen every day in the system. All you need to do is go and do a survey they will tell you whether water is hypoxic or not. Now, in fact, a lot of countries is using that, like the NOVA, National Oce Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They are now using muscles and oil to monitor contaminants, US water, instead of measuring metals in water. That's what they call the Global Muscle Watch, which started in the uh, 80s. And then US EPA, and are now assessing the ecological condition of natural resources instead of measuring the pollutants in these sort of areas directly. And a lot of regulatory authority are now using this benthic animal and uh, biological indicators to monitor environmental changes. And also use a fish with the pathology symptom as the primary indicator of biological effect of contaminant exposure. Now, Environment Canada and Department of Fisheries and Oceans, they use bacterial tank and for red tide toxin, they measure red tide toxin shellfish instead of measuring red tide toxin water now and look at body burden of mercury and PAH and look at the condition of benthic animal indicate community changes. Same in Australia and New Zealand. Then in fact, they are in Australia and New Zealand they are pretty advanced in using ecosystem monitoring and bioaccumulation monitoring. And then they use the EROD, which I told you before, as in flathead to detect pollution. And using the condition of benthic community for monitoring sewage outfall. And same as in UK and Europe, and then using histopathology symptom and using the EROD, the enzyme, the <clears throat> acetylcholine esterase, the monitoring pollution, and do without measuring the chemical itself. Now, then I'll give you a brief comparison on the pros and cons of chemical monitoring. For chemical monitoring is very accurate and simple. You actually provide the data, something like the metal of, sorry, the concentration of pH is 0.163 micrograms per liter, right? For biological monitoring is less accurate. They can only provide you data, something like what's the concentration of the certain enzyme in the fish, and each individual fish may vary, okay? So less accurate. For chemical monitoring, as I said before, continuous measurement is normally easy. Put a buoy over there, put satellite monitoring, and so on. Biological monitoring, very difficult for continuous measurement. For chemical monitoring, the technique is more well established. For biological monitoring, the technique is less established and depends on what kind of animal you have there. For chemical monitoring, it is very costly and very laborious in sampling. And whereas for biological monitoring, the sampling is much easier. For biological chemical monitoring, <clears throat> The concentration is low, making analysis more difficult. For biological monitoring, if you want to measure metals and trace organics in, in the fish, this concentration is higher, the analysis would be much easier. Now, for chemical monitoring, you measure certain things, just like what I said before, and so on. You don't know this chemical will enter the biological system. The biological availability is not known. And this is why the biological effect is not known. It's just based on guessing. For both biological monitoring, they indicate the biological availability directly. So what you see is actually the effect. Now, for chemical monitoring, as I showed you before, in, for very example, you got large variation. Variation for two or three times within a month. So you have to do regular monitoring. For biological monitoring, the time integration is built in. And then for chemical monitoring, it's very easy for you to compare the same data 
between location, between region, you want to compare the level of pH in the uh, Port Phillip Bay in Australia with uh, Manila Bay, it's easy. But for biological monitoring, it's not comparable because the biota, the, the species in Australia is very different from that in the Philippines. For chemical monitoring, you only base on the level of pollutant and then you try to guess or, or predict what's the result, whether it's acceptable or not. But for biological monitoring, this gives you the direct interpretation of result. So having said this, can we have the best of both works? Just like, do you know this, this joke that people like to have the good end of both works? And then both works is that uh, you earn money from US and then you got the US salary, you got a Chinese food, <clears throat> you got a Japanese wife, you got a British house. But unfortunately you may get a sort of income from China and the food from Britain and the wife from America and the house from Japan. No, that's not, can we do that? So we have initiated, I told you before, we have initiated, the US have initiated the Global Muscle Watch program since the eighties. And globally, they collect muscles and look at a range of pollutant, including metals and trace organic in the muscles and try to make comparison. But however, if you look at even the bio, uh, even the metals and the and the trace organics are bi biologically available in the muscle, the metal content is significant effect by a physical factor like water depth, substrate type, temperature, <clears throat> turbidity, salinity, food availability, and by bi bi biological factors like the seasons, lipid content, age and body size of muscles and reproductive stage of muscle and so on. Now, the other problem is the animal may be intolerant or affect by the prevailing environmental condition, which you don't know. Just like in Hong Kong, you put the muscle in Victoria Harbor, a polluted site, yeah, the muscle will die, okay? You put the animal in the sort of estuarine water and then they may affect the uptake. So again, different species may take up different methods. And the limit of natural distribution over large geographical area like in the US create a big problem. In the Muscle Watch program, the Americans use 25 different species of biowolf from over 60, over 76 location along the East Coast and the West Coast. So how do you compare the metal concentration and the to uh, toxic organic concentration in these 25 different species. And it's not comparable because the reproductive season is different. The susceptibility and my manufacturer is different. So they've been spending 30 or 40 years doing that and end up with without much result. <laughs> and then our group have developed an artificial muscle, a novel chemical device for more metal monitoring. This just costs something like 50 US cents to develop this with a complex uh, resin size suspended in the uh, artificial seawater and plugged on both sides with permeable gel. And then this using Kalex or PS, PSTA, which they can absorb different metals. And then our laboratory experiment demonstrate the artificial muscle can take up a range of metal, including cadmium, chromium, copper, <coughs> and zinc lead and mercury simultaneously in those dependent manner without being interfered by temperature and salinity to any quick extent and reach equilibrium within 14 days. And the concentration of metal in the artificial muscle therefore reflect the average concentration of metal during the deployment period. So all you need to do, uh, skip this, and all you need to do is to put this in the environment and then you then, after 14 days, you take this up and analyze the data. And then this shows a very good correlation with the muscles. With the, with the, 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 that is to say, the take up and the accumulation of each metal in the artificial muscle is very similar and got a very good correlation with the muscles in Hong Kong. The advantage is that the metal content would directly reflect the average environmental concentration over time. 
and they only take up the biological available fraction and provide a time integrated estimate and less affected by the physical factor and any oceanographic condition. So not limited by location and pollution level and put it anywhere. So these new device enable us for the first time provide metal concentration in water all over the world, provide worldwide comparison for the first time, which the, yeah, the chemical analysis cannot do and also the artificial, the, also the natural muscle cannot do. And then this work was featured in the frontier and ecology and the environment. And then we've been commissioned by the United Nations, UN, UNEP and PAMC, and then IAEA and for conduct various training course in Hong Kong, Austria, Philippines, Indonesia, and Bangladesh, and also in Japan and over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And then now, the program has been extended over 29 countries, uh, over uh, spending all the six continents. Now, so for this monitoring, we have spent a lot of effort, but we still have a long way to go, but at least we make a stop. So I'll stop here, and uh, if you have any question, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor, for your sharing. Yeah, and uh, uh, a lot of experience sharing and a personal reflection along with your long professional journey in this area. So then uh, we may close uh, the morning session. So you have enjoy your lunch for two hours. We may come back uh, in two hours, okay? Uh, two o'clock in Hong Kong time and uh, one, sorry, one o'clock in Cambodian time. Okay. Mm. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone, Bye. for your participation Thank and you. Your time and during the morning. Okay. Have a break. Enjoy a break. Bye. 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 See you soon. See you later.